We're on a mission from God. Wendy? So I got that going. Darling? Looks like I picked the wrong week to quit sniffing blue. Light of my life. We enjoy your films. I am a human being. I thought they smelled bad. On the outside. Welcome to Vintage Video, where we're rewatching the 80s so you don't have to. We'll be reviewing every major film release of the 1980s in real time. I'm Patrick O'Reilly. I'm Jesse Bayless. And I'm Richard Wells. And today marks the 40th anniversary of the release of Little Darlings on March 21st, 29180? I'm going to guess 1980, since that's when all the other movies came out. <laughs> it's a really good <laughs> Thousands guess. Thousands of years in the future. <laughs> 1980. Uh, it was written by Kimmy Peck and Daylene Young, based on a story by Peck, directed by Ron Maxwell, and released by Paramount Pictures. Tatum O'Neill taught Christy McNichol to smoke for this film, a habit she maintained for 10 years after the production. Great Both friend. Act- Does they actually smoke real cigarettes? Yeah, that was the Aww. 80s. That's what you did. Aww. Both actresses had previously been up for the role of Amanda Wurlitzer in 1976's Bad News Bears, a contest Tatum won. The original choice of the writers for Angel Bright was Brooke Shields, but her price was too high. Um, So McNichol was brought in after losing the role of Annie in Foxes to Cherry Curry, whose mother was played by Tatum O'Neill in The Runaways, a film about the band starring Dakota Fanning as Cherry. Wow, that is a bunch of weird connections. Yeah. Uh, I think I'm, I'm glad that it was not Brooke Shields. Yes. Because I think McNichols is amazing. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, and I was going to say, like, is this coming off Brooke Shields' Blue Lagoon fame? But I guess we're going to get that later. That's later this that's year, later. yeah. Uh, so uh, I don't know why her price was so high. Yeah, I, I'm not actually familiar with what she did before Blue Lagoon, but I'm, we'll get to that later this year, obviously. Yeah. But that's interesting that she was up for what, what it was the role of Annie. Right, which I don't think she's... I yeah. mean, she does have, like, that edgy attitude, but I think that Cherry Curry was the right choice. No, there. I think, but I, but I feel like you need somebody who's like um, a little ditzier. Well, ditzier, but I also think like more like uh, like skewing older in like that sexy look kind of. Sure, thing, you know, like like she's very much looks like a te- like a young teen in this yeah. movie. So, and even here, <laughs> she uh, Christy McNichol seems like a believable 14, 15 year old. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Which I feel like people don't do that in films anymore yeah that's true like everybody that i mean even even in the 90s everybody that was it's supposed to be playing a teen was probably 30 years old yeah and in that movie they're all like the right age for the part because there were a lot of really great child actresses at the time yeah um perry king was originally cast as gary who is the camp coach um but left after a disagreement with the director or producer it wasn't clear from the imdb trivia but by the time Armand Asante was brought on, the film was half shot. So they were like just waiting for someone to fill that role before they could go back and shoot all the scenes with him. See, there's um, not that many scenes with the counselor in it. Yeah. So that's not terribly shocking. And the scenes he's in don't have a lot of the other kids for the most part. If with, any. It's, yeah, it's basically like the just the pool scene, scene. And our pool scene, yeah. yeah. Well, the pool scene is just even her and him because... Well, they circle around her when uh, she's pulled out. So. Yeah, and he's having them do exercises and stuff. Yeah. Um, and, uh, I don't recognize much of Perry King's credits, but he was President Blake in The Day After Tomorrow. Um. Great. (laughs) Good for him. (laughs) So that stuck. He managed to stay on for the whole production. Um, and, uh, for a while, Bad Robot was developing a remake of this film, which a friend of ours wrote, Susanna Fogel, Hmm. um, had written the script for it. I guess the movie never came to be, but it was around the same time that J.J., switched to do super eight it's such a shame because i think this movie would be would have would make a fabulous remake and and and, and susanna and the susanna no choice. nobody would be better at writing this movie than than susanna like as i i really think that this movie um was was really ahead of its time yeah. in terms of how it 
uh, approaches uh, female sexuality and like coming of age for girls. Um, and I don't think you can say this about a lot of movies in the 80s, but I think this totally holds up in, you know, the Me Too era. And, yeah. um, you know, because I think that they really maintained um, like sort of the innocence and, you know, uh, naivete of the girls as well as like, ex- you know, really honestly exploring how they're they're really kind of childish about how they they don't know about sex and then how they come to to learn about it in sort of this childish way and then the realities of what it is once they you know at at least when some of the characters have actually experienced it yeah which brings me to a very interesting question that building up on your point who is this movie for young girls but it's rated r it is rated so young R. girls cannot see it. Well, they saw it. Well, I think they saw it anyways. But it's really interesting that it's rated R because I don't think that the, that this movie would have gotten an R rating now. Oh, absolutely I, I don't, not. There's nothing in it that is explicit. Yeah, but just the the fact that it was a contest to lose your virginity was enough at the time for the MPAA to say, "All right, we kids can't see this then because we don't want people to." emulate this contest and then hold us liable for it or something yeah yeah i think the there was well we'll get to it later i was gonna say there's only one part of this movie that doesn't hold up in the in the modern era that would have to kind of be adjusted for a remake but we'll, we'll get to that when we go through the plot um, i'm also going to go ahead and um, assume some genders here and say that a large part of the realistic portrayal of all these teen girls is due to the fact that this is written by kimmy peck and dalian wood who i believe are both women I didn't look that up completely, but Kimmy is K-I-M-I, and Daylene doesn't sound like a guy's name, but I don't know. Yeah. But I just guessing based on the content, I would assume that these are both female screenwriters. Well, Daylene is a woman, but uh, at least according to IMDb. Kimmy Peck, K-I-M-I Peck. Ex-wife of Stephen Peck. So who's the son? Oh, so she's the ex-wife of Stephen Peck, who's the son of Gregory Peck. Oh, okay. So she is a member of the Peck Pecks. <laughs> the Peck Pack? The Peck Pack, the peck if pack. you will. <laughs> is that what they call themselves? Yeah. So, I, yes. I, both both writers were female. Interesting that they don't... Like, Kimmy Peck has no other credits here. Let me look up this other one. But again, it's so up Susanna's alley just to have, like, the two best friends. And specifically, like, these two archetypes of best friends. It feels very much like The Spy Who Dumped Me or uh, Booksmart. <laughs> There was a TV movie of Little Darlings. Well, it was a it was sort of a, a re-edit of this. Oh, interesting. They okay. plugged in some scenes and they took out some scenes without the director's participation that to make like it not idea. about losing virginity, <clears throat> but rather about getting them to fall in love with you. Oh, that's that's a terrible plan. And not only is it a terrible plan, I think it kind of messes up the Ferris storyline. But we'll get to that when we get to it. Uh, I mean, it messes up. A lot of things about this movie. I mean, I really, really love this movie. Like, yeah. I, I've seen it before, and I'm, I was happy to watch it again because I really love it. I think that it's really honest in a lot of the portrayal of, of, of friendships and, you know, uh, you know, young women exploring sexuality, which I don't think is a topic that even movies now would broach with this much... Uh, accuracy yeah so i think to to then take it and try to like make it into something else that's you know more palatable for people like that that just seems really offensive to me yeah yeah it does kind of defeat the purpose of of like the whole message of the film to be like oh but what if it wasn't about virginity (laughs) what if we took away the part that makes the story interesting at all and informative to people yeah they want to go shopping how yeah. about, can we somehow manipulate it about them going shopping? Yeah. Well, I would I think something that I really love about this movie was that there, nobody in this movie is judgmental about these girls. Like, yeah. the, you know, the the parents, the counselors, like n- nobody is being judgmental. Like when you know, or the, the the characters to each other. I mean, there is some you know insults that fly back and forth, yeah. but like they're they're never insulting each other for, you know, for. for for their interest in in sex or for well, I would argue that Cinder is yeah she's, pretty she is being judgmental just in terms of if you haven't had sex you don't matter as a person right 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 but like I think that then all the women banding together and and being like 
you know, we're interested and we don't really understand this. Yeah. You know, it's, I think it's, I just think it's a really accurate portrayal and a really interesting take on it. And I don't think that, that they don't put a lot of baggage on top of it. Like it's just really earnest. I felt like that in Foxes too, that when they, when they end up talking to adults about what they're doing, like one of the moms was pretty cool about everything and was like yeah. getting them beer for the party. And when she's talking to one of the school administrators about like, one of the kids had an abortion or something like that. And he's just like, well, yeah, you know, sometimes you got to do that. It's not like, well, well, hold on a second. What are you talking about? It's just like, uh, yeah, yeah, we're dealing with a real, like a real situation yeah. and, and these it, are real people. It didn't seem like anybody who made this movie had any sort of agenda. Like, yeah. It was just, yeah. this is just a story. And it's, you know, it's what it's young, what young women will go, would go through. Yeah. They set it up. Um, the very first shot is Angel walking by some clotheslines outside a house and a guy starts hitting on her like slide me something nice and she just turns around and kicks him in the balls and that immediately sets the stage for her character which is a, that it's like i don't respond well to this approach and i'm also not 100 percent interested in men in this way yeah i love it because it's it sets her up really well as a character in terms of like you know sort of being this no nonsense awesome person yeah but also it's it's what we all want to do. Right. Like, I, you guys, <laughs> I'm sure you haven't experienced this. Oh, but this I have. Is, okay. Well, I apologize then for <laughs> presuming that you haven't gone through this. But, I mean, this is this is what every woman goes through when, you know, they're a teenager. And they're wearing totally reasonable clothing. Like, she's just literally in a t-shirt and jeans. Yeah, asking for it, basically. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And, um, and, and, and usually we just have to sit there and grin and bear it because, like, you don't know... You don't know what this person's going to do to you, so you just kick keep him walking. in the nuts. But no, you kick him in the nuts. That yeah. is the right response. <laughs> She's also smoking a cigarette here to give her the extra sense of cool. Oh, um, I, though I, I I made an observation when we were watching this movie that uh, smoking cigarettes like back in the day made you look cool, and now I feel like it just makes you look old. Yeah. Because young people don't smoke cigarettes anymore so the only people that smoke cigarettes are old <laughs> yeah yeah right now teens are vaping yeah but that's, to be that's clear smoking are. still makes you look cool it just does make you look older than you are <laughs> that's why it makes you look cool. that's right kids smoking makes Smoke you cool. them up <laughs> nothing makes you look lamer than vaping that's what i'm trying to say just just get a cigarette but anyway <laughs> by the way we have a sponsor today no Cigarette brand, cigarettes. She hops into a convertible with her mom who says, I don't like you smoking while she's smoking. Mm -hmm. And the daughter kind of gets the irony of this and laughs it off and tosses her cigarette out of the car. Like, I, I get it. That's funny. But I'll stop smoking because you asked me to. It seems like they have a pretty good relationship. And yeah, it kind of sets her mom up as being kind of irresponsible, though. A little bit, but I, I don't think it was drastically irresponsible. I, I like that they get along. It doesn't seem like she doesn't care at all what her daughter is doing. She cares enough to tell her to throw the cigarette out. Yeah, but it, I mean, I think it sets their relationship up of more of like more friendly. Like this is yeah. the this is the young hip mom. It's not, you know, it's not a strict relationship. Sure. And uh, at the same time, we're cutting back to Ferris, the Tatum O'Neill character, leaving her home, which is an enormous mansion, and we have one of these split focus takes where there's like a line down the middle of the screen to show us so that we can read the Rolls Royce logo right, right. in the foreground. And there's like a weird random audio dip just for a one line of, that's a sharp outfit. I was like, <laughs> why did we have to dip the audio to get that line? I don't even need the line. Yeah. I just seeing them walking is enough. I don't need the line that they they're were sharp like, outfit. Her dad needs to be nicer. Let's keep making her dad nice the whole time. But uh, it seems like her, her dad is the one taking her to the car, right? And he drives her to... Yeah, well, or, we, or find, the driver we, drives. we find out why later. Right. But uh, so uh, Ferris leaves her mansion and her Rolls Royce to get to the the bus to camp, which is getting loaded up with kids in a parking lot. Um, it seems like the last two kids to arrive are going to be Angel and Ferris. Uh, Angel's mom pulls in with the convertible, which backfires right as she's pulling into a parking spot. And everyone turns to look at this crappy convertible car to just like accentuate how disgusted everyone is by her poverty. I guess, like, it seems like... <laughs> it seemed like a fine car to me. I, yeah, yeah, it seemed pretty yeah. cool. It's like, if cars backfire all the time... But everyone looked at it like it was gross, and it would have just been like, oh, no, cool, a convertible. Anyway, but um, uh, she gets out, Angel gets out, and uh, 
climbs into the car with all the other kids and they're talking about their celebrity crushes kind of dating the film a little bit we have john travolta andy gibb for some reason (laughs) i I didn't realize like that was like a teen heartthrob situation but i guess and uh, one of them says that she saw last tango in paris 10 times just not a kid's movie but it just goes to show you that girls this age were able to get into r-rated movies or or x as might be the case with that particular film uh ferris's dad gets there late after the bus is already pulling out of the parking lot and he's just pulling up alongside it honking at it so that it'll stop and uh when she gets in there's there's really only one seat left yeah exactly one yeah which is right next to angel and when she tries to take it angel's like find another seat but the it's not like there's a bunch of seats to choose from and she's Mm -hmm. like no don't sit next to me there's literally only one seat and uh the two of them start a fight here and the bus driver just like pulls over and looks at him (laughs) he's like hey what's going on back there what's the problem back there yeah it's so funny all right back to work yeah that solved it like just turn around and say what's happening all right keep driving the girls kind of crowd into uh a bathroom when they get to the camp and Cinder determines very quickly that a couple of these girls are virgins, uh, specifically Angel and Ferris, and she's giving them crap about it and talking about how special she is because she's an actress and she works in commercials and her boyfriend's hot. Um, oh, her she's fiance. A, she's, she's engaged. Oh, is it a fiance? Yeah. I that. Okay. Yeah. So that's why her parents sent her to camp was to have have it cool down a bit. But you know, her parents don't know anything, and that's not going to work. Yeah. Everyone, she's in love. <laughs> it's uh, it's interesting. At the beginning, they're being called out for different reasons. I forget what Ferris does that gives away that she's a virgin. But I know that when she asks Angel what she thinks of boys, she says like, "I, I don't think much of them." Like, the, yeah, who needs guys, basically? And uh, and she's like, "Oh, okay, so we have another virgin. Maybe you're not even into men." Which later in life, Christy McNichol did come out as a lesbian, but. I don't think that was supposed to be the point of her character here. Unless it is. I don't know. No. I don't no. I don't think so. I don't think so. Um, this, this movie is pushing a lot of boundaries. It is not pushing that boundary. Yeah. Or maybe it is, and it just didn't announce it. Eh? You ever think about that? Anyway. Everyone's sent to their cabins, and Cinder bets a residual check from her recent commercial that uh, Ferris will lose her V-card first. She holds up her residual check that yeah. she kept in the room. And it's like, what, did, are, were you planning on cashing in that? Or yeah. was it just for bragging rights? Are you just going to sign it over to us? Oh, it for sure was for bragging rights. But it's just like, why did your parents let you bring your residual like, check to camp? Okay, I'm $100. packing for camp. I need three pairs of shorts, a couple of t-shirts, and this residual check. Uh, we get a quick montage of uh, the kids doing camp stuff. <laughs> Uh, for a while. I was like, man, this is a really crazy first day. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's baseball and it's swimming. It's clearly supposed to be like two or three weeks of activities. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, they're playing a softball game and Angel hits uh, Ferris with a pitch. <laughs> we cut to them at the at the cafeteria and Sunshine, the, the first feature film appearance of Cynthia Nixon as this adorable little hippie girl, um, she drops a couple of pills into Ferris's drink and says, It's ginseng. It'll make you sexy. <laughs> and she just drinks it, no question. She's just like, oh, okay, perfect. I want to be sexy. That's great. Yeah. And Patrick stopped the film at this point and went and got himself some ginseng. Yeah. <laughs> just been chugging it ever since. <laughs> Hence this. Oh, this isn't a video podcast. It's a face for podcast. Sorry, listeners. You're missing out. <laughs> Various cabins are approaching their table as they're eating and placing their bets on which girl they think is going to lose her virginity first. Like, entire cabins are pooling whatever money they brought together to say, Mm -hmm. I think Ferris is going to do it. I think Angel's going to do it. But I'm a little confused about the betting system here. Like, who... So, like, she put up her residual check on... And she betted on Ferris to win. And then the other people are putting up their pools of cash on whoever they want. But, like... They're getting their money back because the money's not going to go to the people who lose their virginity. Right. You're basically mm-hmm. as as long as the bets are even, you're going to double your money. Right. Okay. Got it. But so Hopefully, the so the only incentive in this for the girls is like to lose your virginity the respect first of losing yeah. your virginity first. Yeah, I don't think either of them stands to make any money off okay. of this unless they're betting on themselves. Well, I, I think Cinder's thing is that I'm betting. $100 to to the two of them. The two of them. Yeah. 
because she because because uh, uh, Angel says, "Well, you just lost a hundred bucks." Yeah. Like you know, but also I guess admitting that she would pay a hundred dollars if she lost. Well, yeah, I don't the, know. her hundred dollar residual check would go to whoever thought Angel was going to lose mm. it first. But yeah, so Ferris asks Coach Gary, Mister Callahan, uh, if he's married, and he says no. And that he's a French teacher at a local high school. And she starts asking, like, oh, is it a private high school? Like, where is this high school? I should go to this high school. Uh, Because she seems to have already picked out um, her target. A couple other girls take binoculars to go spy on the naked boys that are skinny dipping at the neighboring camp across the lake. Are they naked? Yeah. Yeah, Did that notice that? It's far enough away that you can't. Like the whole point I is that you I can't make anything out. I guess I wasn't like you were at the <laughs> naked boys. Yeah, well, I I backed it up real quick. I enhanced. <laughs> um, well, looks well, like they've been taking their ginseng. I'll tell you that. <laughs> well, well, because the girls are talking about it. Like you can't get pregnant from looking. <laughs> God, I hope not. <laughs> God, I hope not. Um, I think it's also worth noting that um, both Angel and Ferris kind of have a team captain, where Ferris is pretty much Cinder is on is her yeah. captain. And Angel has uh, Dana, uh, who's kind of like... Is that the girl that's always quoting Shakespeare? Yeah. Uh, who is... It's very tragic. Uh, she died five years later. Oh, really? At the age of 23. Oh. They don't know why. She was just found dead one day. Oh, my God. Huh. And I was just like, oh, my goodness. It's like a, I was reading it because I was trying to do research. On I'm her, glad but, you caught that. I missed that completely. Yeah. And I was like, oh. And it was like, her cause of death is still unknown. It's like, What? So it's not like she was missing or anything. She was literally, they just found her. Yeah, they went to her apartment and she was dead. Wow. Uh, That's crazy. She has a really funny line there when they're watching the the boys. She's Because she's always quoting Shakespeare throughout. Mm -hmm. And she says, Ah, Unmatched form and feature. A blown youth blazed with ecstasy. Oh, woe is me. To see what I have seen. See what I see. (laughs) (laughs) She's just like updating it to what's going on right now. But that's crazy. I yeah, I totally missed that point. Angel tells them that she doesn't think she doesn't find this activity very amusing, the spying on the boys. And then one of them brings up, well, hold on a second. Don't we need wouldn't wouldn't these girls need condoms if they're trying to lose their virginity? Because nobody here is interested in getting pregnant in their early teens. And they're like, oh no, isn't that the boys' job? And it's like, no, not since the pill. Basically, it's, yeah. Suddenly that's on us. So they decide what they need to do is go into town and get some condoms. So they steal a bus. <laughs> steal I love them. it. I love yeah. it. It's like that no one notices that one of the buses is missing. Yeah, I, I love that it didn't actually like backfire on them at all, the stealing yeah. the bus. It was just like, a no, Angel's streetwise enough to get this bus started and doesn't need like the right class license to drive it. Mm-hmm. I also um, just like the fact that they wrote into this movie the girls being proactive about their reproductive health. Yeah. Like, yeah. I just think that's fabulous. Like, yeah. They, that they're just like... Oh, they're going to take it into their own hands. They're being responsible. They're being thoughtful about this. And they're going to go steal some condoms. (laughs) (laughs) They're going to be responsible. They're going to steal a bus they can't legally drive (laughs) and steal condoms. Yes. Um, well, and and it's, it's weird because I you know it never occurred to me that there probably wouldn't be condom machines in the women's restroom. Right. No, just like there's not changing tables in the men's restroom. Yeah. Yeah. Which is why Life that's is why I keep getting caught in women's restrooms. <laughs> I just want to explain myself here. I have a child. I swear. Where is it? Look, I, funny I thing. have a child. I didn't say it was here. I said I had a child. You're you're putting words in my mouth. This is ridiculous. Where are my pants? I'm the victim here. <laughs> But yeah, so they get to this gas station just outside the camp, I guess. And the door to the men's room is locked. Presumably the key is uh, in the store and the guy yeah, would have to give it to them if they were buying something. But uh, they don't want to buy anything but the well, condoms. But also it's the men's room, so he probably wouldn't give them the key to the men's anyway, room. Yeah. They decide they're going to take their, their smallest member and throw her up through the window into the mm-hmm. men's room. But uh, she gets in there and... I think she puts a couple coins in the machine and nothing comes out. Yeah. She's also supposed to be 10. Like, right. Like, all the other girls are, like, 15, and she didn't want to be in the kid cabin, and so yeah. she convinces her way into this group, even though she's, like, five years younger than the rest yeah, of them. Yeah, she kept complaining about what all the little kids are doing. She's like, oh, yeah. they're just singing songs about dumb stuff and telling campfire stories. And uh, so she gets in there. She can't get any condoms out of the machine, so she decides she's just going to bust this machine off the wall. Um, which she eventually does. Meanwhile, Matt Dillon pulls up as Randy, 
and he sees Angel Aptly hanging named. out of the, <laughs> Yeah. Uh, <laughs> he sees Angel hanging out of the side of the bus, and she's like, oh, hey, where do you live? Me? I know where I live. She keeps picking on him and trying mm. to outsmart him and stay ahead of him. I think I think it's totally adorable. Yeah, it, totally. It, it worked on me. And then uh, <laughs> and he's like, she's like, oh, what's your name? And he's like, what? And he's like, I know my name. <laughs> like, she just keeps using these same tricks on him. Um, and then when she says that her name's Angel, she says, but don't let the name fool you. And then he says, it's Randy. Don't let the name fool you. <laughs> Which is like the perfect comeback. She she just completely set it up for him. But also the tagline for this movie, uh, the title of the film is Little Darlings. And the tagline was, but don't let the title fool you. That's so great. Yeah. This movie's so great. I love this movie. So she steals the whole condom machine. Um, and they basically, they all leave back to the camp in the bus. And they bust up this condom machine, like the office space copier in the middle yeah. of the field. Like it's a giant like condom pinata and so when it gets busted open all the kids are just grabbing handfuls of condoms and running Mm -hmm. back to their cabin and then we're in the cafeteria again where uh angel leans over and uh spills something on ferris and pretends it was an accident well i think uh ferris does something first i can't remember what ferris started i couldn't remember uh she she like knocks something over and then and then Angel goes full glass of milk. Yeah. Or I thought oh, it was no, the other no, way no, around. No, no, you're Angel, right. Angel starts it Angel because somebody said it. pass right. the bread. She chucks a piece of bread over at them and like knocks something over. Mm-hmm. And then to get back at him, Ferris, Ferris goes and like leans over and dumps the whole glass of milk over. Yeah. And then full on food fight. Yeah. yeah. And, and she gets hit in the face with some waffles. And... Yeah. There, there's a lot of milk pouring on people which just makes me horribly cringy yeah i was like oh god they're pouring so much milk on each other i don't like this at yeah all. that's that's just the grossest smell later in the day little did we know about richard's milk phobia yeah I was like, uh. and it's, it's like it's like a summer camp like, right but like i think it's from... actually a law or it might have been a law in the 80s you're not allowed to make a summer camp movie that doesn't have a food fight in the cafeteria. Well, it, it, but it's more so like it's like it's so hot. <laughs> milk was a bad milk choice. was a bad choice. Milk was a bad choice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but and it is funny that it's like basically we see each of these kids throw everything that's on the table in front of them. Yeah, and then we cut to a wide shot and they suddenly have a full meal in front of them to do it again because otherwise this food fight would have taken like 15 seconds to be over mm. because everyone's everyone just has an unlimited supply of food. It's like the, the it's like the food fight in Hook where yeah. you're just pulling food out of nowhere to throw at people. But in the end of it, both Ferris and Angel are laughing yeah. with each other. Pretty early in the fight, I think they're both yeah. cracking up. There's there's a really great line I like. When uh, you can tell that they're like legitimately having fun while they do it, but uh, Angel looks at Ferris in her shirt and it's like completely covered in in all kinds of different food, like frosting and waffles mm. and whipped cream and milk. And she's like, "Oh, purple, my favorite color. I hope it comes out." <laughs> and Tatum's just like cracking up. Because I don't think they were meant to be laughing at the season. I just don't think they could help it. Yeah, but I don't think it hurts the story at all. No, no, not yeah. at all, not at all. Because they, ha- I mean, that's what the, this movie is about. Their their sort of budding relationship and you know coming together to understand each other. Yeah, we move from this. The food fight is broken up by a, a woman that works at the camp who tells everyone to stop and then is immediately hit in the face with something. Yeah, uh, is she hit in the face? With something? Yes. 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 Yeah, yes, yes, she, she does get hit. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, she, it's Miss Nichols, played by Mary Benton, uh, who. Did some things, but uh, most notably, and I feel bad saying that, that when she passed away, she passed away right here in Camarillo. Oh, did so, she really? So how about that? Um, she died only a couple of years ago. Huh. Uh, we but, started this show too late. Yeah. I, I just thought it was funny that uh, 81 died at 81, uh, age 81 in Camarillo. I was like, Probably huh. like 100 feet that way. <laughs> Uh, but yeah. <laughs> Wait, it's like in our, in our house. In our house, yeah. <laughs> that creepy. must be that woman I murdered two years ago. <laughs> no. Thanks for the house. <laughs> it's got a really great lived-in feel. <laughs> it's also got that creepy died-in feel. <laughs> Rip. <laughs> um. a creepy died-in feel. Ferris talks with someone. Her yeah. mom. I can't figure out who this woman is. I don't know either. She doesn't show up 
before or after this scene in the whole movie. I, I thought it was a counselor, um, but it's a uh, it's a blonde woman who seems to be an adult because she's talking to her about the side effects of sex. Yeah, she's like, "You make it sound like a disease." Well, it kind of is. Yeah, you, I I don't do I think it it, I think it's just a counselor. Okay. Well, I couldn't tell if it was her mom because we followed this conversation immediately with the all the parents are at camp seeing how their kids are doing. Yeah. So I thought it was possible that it was oh, her maybe. mom there. But then later she's talking to her dad. Because her mom does have a credit. Well, there is someone credited as her mom. Oh, well, maybe that is supposed to be her mom. But then... There's no other scene that her mom would have been in. Correct. So it must be her mom. I just don't think they make it very clear. Yeah. Also, I don't like that other phobia time for Richard. <laughs> I don't like that they're in this field of tall weeds is like oh they're gonna get so many ticks there's gonna be ticks <laughs> <laughs> oh man richard had a rough time with this movie yeah this movie's hitting all the wrong richard movies never... should be interiors <laughs> richard never actually went to summer camp <laughs> no i did not or milk camp <laughs> gary leads a group of the girls in an exercise alongside a pool he says they'll thank him for it when they're when they're 40. It's not clear why they would do that or yeah. what he's talking about because this exercise is going to last a grand total of three minutes. Well, he's also expertly evading all of their, like, questions. Right. Mr. Callahan? What? Doesn't Ferris have great legs? <laughs> they're going to look a lot better after this exercise because yeah. they're going to be tone and fit. <laughs> <laughs> but then one of them, uh, I think Cinder pulls her aside and says, you better make this look real. Before she pushes Ferris into the pool. And Ferris basically pretends she's drowning. And Gary jumps in to help her out. And even though she's like breathing and laying down with her eyes open on the side of the pool. They're like, oh, she needs mouth to mouth. You have to help her. Well, I didn't know if this was like they're just being really naive. Or like like they didn't know that... You know, you no, I, I had think to pretend not to be breathing. She, or she's just a really bad actress. I, yeah, I don't think it. I don't think it was. It was Ferris not realizing how she would get mouth to mouth. I think it was just like the whole point of this exercise was to convince him that she doesn't know how to swim, so that he would offer to give her swimming lessons. They oh, okay. Have one more one on one time, um, which does happen. Gary is teaching her how to swim, and Cinder and Sunshine are watching through binoculars from the middle of the woods. Uh, Sunshine is playing like this recorder or yeah. some kind of a flute um <laughs> she's playing a terrible song and then cinder's like why don't you play something sexy and then she plays a different terrible song equally unsexy song but cinder seems very satisfied she's like perfect this is it i think it was like a it was supposed to be a uh, like a sexy middle eastern song like uh you know like your snake charming kind of song yeah i, I it's it's not even i i think she's actually playing here um which is why i think it's hard to tell what they're doing <laughs> because she's a child playing a flute well, they might try, have intended... we're trying to tame some snakes here, right sweetie. but they might have intended to dub over this with a clearly sexual song and then yeah. at the last second they were like nah, yeah that's, that's pretty sexy <laughs> we'll leave that in at the same time as uh cinder and sunshine are watching this swimming lesson go on angel and dana go to watch randy on his uh, motorbike the boys camp seems really cool everyone yeah. gets their motorcycle <laughs> and they're just like racing them around in a field um and and angel like points out which one is randy yeah, and they're Dana's not like, really racing them around in a the field they're sitting there like doing donuts in the field yeah. sure like, yeah it's they're just being well, idiots. donuts are round <laughs> but dana's like oh yeah wow he's really great and then he falls off of his bike immediately after she says that and angel's like yeah he, he'll do yeah and then they get a big face full of dirt right from the whoever hit that dirt into their face couldn't have been more than like five feet away from them and they're already like not hidden at all by this fence right so they're they're very clearly just out in the open and these guys know they're there and just intentionally threw a bunch of dirt in their faces but uh then we we move through the kids uh the parents coming to the camp and we get just little glimpses of each of the kids with their moms and dads two of the kids from uh from uh ferris and angel's cabin are sitting between their parents and they're like oh I, you guys seem really happy now but i bet you fight when we're gone and they're like no we love each other and then their mom leans over and pulls out the uh, drawer of their dresser and it's just <laughs> full of condoms just overflowing with condoms and she's like uh and pushes yeah, it closed her and eyes are like, like bugging out and like uh <laughs> the like, dad's oh. like oh is she getting any neater oh yes uh yes and then we see ferris with her dad on a bridge 
near the camp and he tells her basically that him and her mother are officially separating yeah uh this is to set up a totally unnecessary ending to the movie i think um because it doesn't have any it doesn't really have a lot of bearing on the story at all um i feel like there's there's actually not enough to ferris's character here and so they're trying to give her something else to deal with but um it seems it seems arbitrary but she finds out that her parents are divorcing Angel basically kidnaps Randy in a boat. She just pulls up to the boys' camp in a canoe, and it's like, hop in, and they leave. We get a little bit of uh, John Lennon here. Uh, one of the reasons that this movie did not come to uh, home video before, like, last year is because there it was a situation like Forbidden Zone where they used a bunch of songs without getting proper rights to them. So there's, there's still no DVD or Blu-ray. The, it just has the theatrical prints obviously, which is what the way I first saw it was a 35 millimeter print at the New Beverly. What we watched was an HD broadcast that had happened mm. that was recorded. But um, there's not an official home release because they did a VHS release that had sound alikes for all the songs because they couldn't get the rights to them. Hmm. But they're, they're closing in on it. I think a Blu-ray is supposed to be coming out soon. That would be excellent. This movie totally deserves a Blu-ray. Yeah. And with the original music, I think. Would I don't be... think people know about this movie. I mean, because it didn't have a home release. Like, I don't think people know about this movie. I, I, it honestly probably did hurt its status as a cult film that it didn't exist beyond VHS. Angel and Randy take the boat to, like, shore and then wander to a graveyard? Yeah, I guess. I'm, I'm assuming it's just someone's property that's nearby the camp. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, the camp doesn't probably own the whole lake. Yeah, because the first time I watched it, I was like, it's clearly a graveyard. And then rewatching it, it's like... These headstones are just rectangles, like wooden well, rectangles. I, didn't, I, I thought they were just pretending that these things sticking up out of the ground looked like graves. Was it actually a I, graveyard? I think it was yeah. supposed to actually be a graveyard. Oh, I thought they were just playing around like, oh, look at this thing. It looks like a grave. I'm going to pretend I'm a dead person. But, yeah. but I think it was like, but like I said, I think it was like a f- small family plot that's yeah. on their land. It seems like a dangerous place to be joking around about things. Because... Mm. <laughs> People who bury their family on their property tend to have guns. I don't know why there's a correlation there, <laughs> but I think there is. It's it's correlation. It's not causation. No, I didn't, they didn't say, shoot their I family didn't say he killed them. <laughs> I'm just saying he'll kill you if you pretend to be a dead body on his kid's grave. I don't know why his kids died first. It's very sad. <laughs> so they go to the graveyard and they drink. Well, he drinks. Yeah. She, it, it, she, well, she holds a beer. Yeah. She doesn't actually. She sips on it. She, she opens it and she sips it. But she's not chugging it like she's making Randy do because her plan is, I'm just going to get him completely drunk and have sex with him here in this graveyard. Because he's pretending to basically be a zombie. He's like mm. laying down over the grave and sitting up like a corpse. Well, also her naivete of that, like getting them drunk makes them horny. Yeah. Like he said, this is going to work. I'm going to get him drunk and he's going to want to have sex with me and then that, this is going to be the end of it. Yeah, but her flaw was bringing a whole six pack to get yeah. a, a young teenager drunk. It's like... No, no, no. One and a half beers makes him horny. <laughs> the other four make him asleep. Um, and that's what happens here. He uh, he passes out and uh, and uh, she is not able to win the bet already. Or is she? Oh, <laughs> she could have very easily right here. But she's respectful. Gary's teaching archery to a bunch of the kids. Um, and, and using incorrect archery terms. Yeah. Well, he Wait, says what did cock he say? instead yeah. of knock yeah, for the like, arrow. Yeah, he's cocking the arrow. I was like, that's not how you say it. And I looked up, I got mad because I was like, that's not what you say. And I was like, well, maybe it was what you say. And I was like, no, it's no, it not. never was. No, it never was. But it's you're supposed to say you knock the arrow mm-hmm. onto the line before you pull it back and let go. And everybody shoots their arrows. And some of the kids are good and some of the kids are bad. Um, and it seems a little dangerous because they're not really concentrating. And they're actually like letting loose some of these not fully like yeah, focused they haven't arrow been pulled shots. back yeah i was like uh, this can go a couple bad a couple different ways yeah i like sunshine too here is like my parents don't want me to get into competitive sports archery's not competitive imbecile <laughs> I, I also like that the objection here would be to competitive sports not the fact that you're using a weapon <laughs> yeah angel takes randy uh to a boathouse from the graveyard and Makes him turn around so that she can undress. Well, uh, we're, we're skipping over just a little bit of Ferris is like in deep depression. Right. Like, and, and Cinder is getting really pissed about it. 
Um, and when and then she comes out, she eventually comes out to the archery session where Gary is concerned. Right. Like he's oh. like showing genuine concern for her. Okay, so I I was really confused about the whole depression thing, but I think I just realized that she's it's depressed be- about her parents. Getting she's separated. depressed about her parents getting divorced because I was like, why are they- why is she suddenly so depressed? And like, there's no explanation. She's like, oh yeah, your parents are getting divorced. I guess that's upsetting. I, I guess, but she doesn't seem that upset. Like, uh, aside from being quiet and claiming to have forgotten her swimming lesson, like, there's not even like a, a tear wiped away. She's not like any less talkative with her different friends when the time comes. People process things in different ways. Well, I'm just saying it. That's why I I felt like that was added later to feed into what seems to be the way they ended this film. Yeah. Unless I'm misinterpreting what happens at the end, but um, but yeah, so she's she's just kind of moping around. But then Angel uh, takes Randy in the boat to a boathouse, and it's starting to rain, and so they're basically taking shelter. And uh, it they they both seem to understand what's going on. They're making out a bit, and uh, she gives him a condom and says to put it on because she doesn't want to get pregnant. He he keeps asking if she's going to get undressed. And she starts to, but she says, don't look at me. Go Look over there. Go around the corner and take your clothes off. I don't, wanna, I don't want you to see me undress. And he's getting more and more impatient with her as she's going. Because she's clearly dragging her feet. She's uncomfortable in the situation. She's not quite ready. I, um, I do like, though, that in this scene, even though she's, you know, she's clearly uncomfortable and not really ready for this and not, you know, not, not super interested in doing this, uh... He's still also pretty, like, awkward about the whole thing. Like, Yeah, like she has to remind him to take his clothes off, too. Which... Yeah, he's not suave here. He's not trying to, like, trick her or anything. He's just also being kind of a awkward teen about it. But he the also thing. feels like he's being very honest with her. Yeah. Um, and I, I did like the line here when she says, because ap- he gets impatient enough and he's like, you know what, you can take all night if you want. I'm out of here. And she's, like, upset. And she's like, okay, well, now what's your problem? Not realizing that it's like, well, he didn't, he doesn't know that you don't, you aren't experienced and he thinks you're playing games with him, basically. And she says, I'm not sexy to you, am I? And he says, all girls are sexy to me. <laughs> Which is, like, the it's exact accurate teenager teenage answer. Teenage boy, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, around a campfire, Cinder sits down next to Ferris and says that she's really disappointed in her. And she says... You don't have to worry because tonight is the night. I'm going to get it taken care of. Um, And she goes to Gary's cabin wearing this like gown that she brought with her. It's like, it's supposed to be like pajamas, I guess. It is. It's just a nightgown. It just, it just looked weird for like walking around outside. Oh, it's just a nightgown. Well, anyway, she walks up to his door wearing the outfit from Defiance that uh, his upstairs neighbor keeps wandering in wearing. It's just a regular nightgown. <laughs> and uh, he lets her in for some reason. They talk for a minute. She tries to like take some wine off of his table. She's just like, oh, I want to have some of this wine. And he's like, no, you can't drink wine here. And she's like, oh, it's okay. I have wine all the time. And, uh, and then he grabs a bottle out of her hand and puts it away. And she's like, eh, it was a bad year anyway. And he laughs at her because he's like, okay, I see, I see what's happening here. You're pretending to be older than you are because you're trying to confuse me. Right, but this is the, like, that moment right there is where he needed to shut it down and just be like, out, yeah, get out. <laughs> he he should have done that a few times over the course of this scene, but that was the first moment where that should have happened. I, honestly, I don't I don't know if he should have let her in right then. No, no, he no, should have he, let her in in the first place, but... I it, guess she did open the door and say, you said I could talk to you if I felt like I was having any problems. Well, right, like which that. is why I think, like, it, it's understandable that he let her in in the first place, yeah. you know, because But when like, she picks yeah. up the wine bottle, you're like, okay, you're like, it's nope, time to go. Now you're done. She starts talking about Juliet and, like, leaning back and smiling on the couch, and uh, he sits down next to her... And she looks at him and she leans in for a kiss with her eyes closed for like eight seconds. <laughs> and he's just staring at her like smiling wide and just like on the verge of laughing at her. And she eventually opens her eyes and kind of smiles back like, okay, this didn't work. And it's kind of funny that you just sat there and watched me do that. But he basically, she says, she says, do you, well, you find me attractive, don't you? And his, the biggest mistake of this scene is when he says, yes. Maybe I do, but that's it's not the point. And basically, with the end of this conversation, he admits that if she were 21, that he would fall madly in love with her. And she 
is ecstatic with this information mm -hmm. that this is for her just as good as if she had just had sex with the guy because she actually genuinely likes this person and he just said if you were 21 we would be dating right now we would be boyfriend and girlfriend and we'd be going to get married and uh I, I think that's an interesting line to draw like why 21 well you, the rule is half your age plus seven so he's doing a lot of quick algebra because they didn't make those kinds of rules in blank check <laughs> what is sorry the, what <laughs> oh because the kid's dating an adult woman in blank yeah check? yeah like this 10 year old <laughs> kid is dating like a 30 year old woman and at the end of the movie they're negotiating how young he needs to be to be able to start dating her and I think that they arrive at like sixteen, and uh, okay. <laughs> well, yeah, that's that's uh, I was like, what? No, none of these is okay. Not even when he's eighteen, it's still weird. Yeah, half your age plus seven. Do the math, people. It's pretty pretty realistic. Is that really what? Like, why they that's said twenty one? That's the Reddit rule: is half your age plus seven. That's yeah, not. I, that's we, not the little darlings no, rule. We're not following Reddit rules in this. I'm house. not doing Reddit's, Armando Sante's math. Yeah, I don't know. Um, but, uh, she kind of wanders back to the cabin, um, where all the girls are waiting and she has the glow of having been told that he would fall madly in love with her if she was 21 and the girls all misinterpret it as you just had sex. Mm -hmm. I don't think she's pretending she just had sex when she walks in. I think she's just happy that he liked her. No, I agree. But she then lets them right. believe it. Like once yeah. they say that she just goes along with it. Yes. Back at the boathouse, uh, Randy tells angel that he's smarter than he looks that he's got the i don't look like i have a lot going on but you know i'm i'm always thinking i i have i have thoughts you know like he's trying to be he's like i know you think i'm an idiot but i'm really not <laughs> and uh and uh he's just trying to to get through to her and send a message to her because they're kind of having um they're they're having a disagreement here and he thinks she's messing with him and he just wants to make it known that he's like i'm not an idiot i can tell what's happening even though he can't really. Ferris tells the girls that uh, she's, she's elaborating on their assumptions that her and Gary had sex. And she says, oh, you know, he, he compared us to Romeo and Juliet, which is what she did. Um, she says that they had chilled champlain, she says. <laughs> yeah. Which is her, like, she, she should know that it's champagne, right? Why do they say champlain? Is that, is that one of those, uh, you know... Like because actual champagne has to come from champagne. Is that one of those like fake champagne names? That would be a really crappy ripoff. Champlain. <laughs> it's just plain. But she says that they had chilled champagne, which I read as her like. It it seemed like uncharacteristically not knowing about champagne for her character, but maybe it maybe it was a joke about that it's like some knockoff champagne. She says that he turned off the lights to avoid embarrassing her. And they're all like, oh my gosh, so chivalrous, so, so romantic, oh how cavalier. We move back to the boathouse uh, where this is a post-coital moment. Angel and Randy have had sex at this point and they're both smoking cigarettes now. And uh, he's standing up against the door and he can't figure out why she's being so weird after they finished. And she admits that she was a virgin up until now and that she didn't tell him because she thought that it would turn him off or that he would think it was weird. And he sits down and tries to comfort her. But I feel bad for him in this scene because she she just keeps repeating like, oh, it wasn't what I thought it would be. You know, I just feel so disappointed. I feel so alone. And he's like, I'm trying to comfort you. <laughs> like, I feel yeah. bad. Like, I didn't know that. And Poor guy. If I'd have known, I probably would have approached this differently. Yeah, I was back and forth about his character the whole time. I was like, is he... A is he a scumbag or is he a nice guy? I can't tell. Cause... I think he's a genuinely nice guy. I don't know. I think that 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 his portrayal, just similar to theirs, is really very realistic. Yeah. But he's not really. He's not supposed to be a caricature of of a teenage boy. He just is a teenage boy, which is like he's just kind of an idiot about these things and doesn't really know any better. But he's not a bad guy for it. Yeah. Um. So uh, back at the cabin, Angel walks in after having left uh randy probably taken him back to his camp uh she walks in and dana stops her at the door and she's like tell me that you won the bet right it's a draw right and she's like no i'm sorry guys i i lost you won this one fair and square and she shakes ferris's hand 
the next day like is like the pre the pre like rehearsals for the talent show right and randy comes by looking for angel but cinder intercepts him and says oh she won't see you because it was just a game you're just you were just used and he's obviously immediately hurt but then turns on a dime and goes oh well what are you doing later and i think the whole point of asking what she's doing later is i'm trying to piss her off now that it wasn't strictly that he's interested in cinder romantically he was just like oh, okay i'm gonna start dating you in front of her because i want her to see how it feels to be toyed with like this ferris goes to gary's cabin to apologize for spreading rumors about him which have apparently circulated back to him because he's fairly upset about it well i'm assuming he got slapped with some kind of statutory rape charge do they, they don't make any indication of that other than that he knows that it happened right well, I think the allegation is, one, he's been fired. Yeah, he, th- oh, he's it, definitely been fired. Oh, I didn't realize that. Yes. And probably pending an investigation for statutory rape. Right. And she never really apologizes. Yeah. She, yeah. She just, like, she just says, like, why she did it. I them to like it. me. Yeah. Um, and, and for getting him in trouble. And I was like, in trouble? No, no, no. Is, I might like, go to this jail. This a really big deal. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> But she still says she loves him. I was like, this isn't helping the situation. Yeah. And and he counters with, oh, you know what? I probably would have done the same thing at your age and gives her a big hug. And it's like, first of all, you shouldn't even be talking to this girl anymore. Like, you shouldn't be talking to her without attorneys present at this point. Yeah. So I feel like this is the this is the moment in the movie. Well, or perhaps later is that moment. We'll break it up later. It's fine. Okay. Um, but yeah, so... Uh, Angel sees Cinder sitting with Randy during a musical performance of a song from a pirate musical. I'm not sure which one. Is it the Pirates of Penzance? Could be. It That's was. The only pirate musical no, I know. No, it was. It, had, it wrote well, that on the, the side HMS of the... Well, Pinafore. That's not a pirate no, musical. No, it was the Pirate of Penzance. Everything it was with boats written is pirates. next to the stage. Was it? Yes. Okay. Muppet Treasure Island. So Randy and Angel right. finally get their moment to talk it out. And, and and again, this is where I was back and forth with Randy because he seems like, like, well, maybe we can make this work. Like, but we still don't know where they live in relationship to each other right. other than that they're at the same summer camp, but they were still bussed in from who knows where. And he's managed to avoid giving her any information about himself other than his, age, or his yeah. name, basically. So, I mean, I, I completely agree with Angel's decision. One, no, this isn't going to work out for many reasons, one of which... Like, we don't know anything about each other. Yeah. Uh, but. Uh, and she she points out that they started the relationship, like, on the wrong foot. That basically, like, the, whole, the, the origin of our relationship is that I was tasked with having sex with someone before I left camp. And that's not a, a good foundation for us to be together in a relationship. But she also says, you know, I'm, I'm not going to forget you. And he seems cool with letting her go i mean at, at, at the beginning of this conversation he's furious and understandably so because he thinks that she only slept with him for a hundred bucks and that she picked him because he was an easy lay and he didn't even get a cut yeah and uh he keeps asking her like oh well how much how much did you win for me and she's just like i, I didn't win i lost it i told them that we didn't do it and then he immediately turns and he's just like oh okay so this wasn't just about money for you and but still, I mean, like, that was the basis for their relationship. He should still be a little bit hurt about it, but he seems to immediately forgive her when he finds out that she didn't do it for the money. And uh, they basically break it off. Angel and Ferris meet at a swing set and admit each of their truths to each other. First, Ferris says that their relationship was fake. And then, uh, and then Angel says, well, you know, well, me and Randy... And then just starts like sobbing and it's pretty clear to Ferris what happened. But they seem like they kind of buried the hatchet and they're legitimate friends at this point now that they're not in competition with each other. Um, now let's get Mr. Gary out of jail. Yeah. So <laughs> all the girls are around a campfire and uh, they're saying like, okay, well, we're going to go talk to, what, what was her name? Mrs. Nichols? Yeah. Ms. Or, Nichols? or anybody. Yeah. Tell somebody that this didn't happen. And that this was like explain a... that we that this was a made up fantasy. And Cinder is telling them, this is a dumb idea. They're just going to think that you're doing it because he's your lover and you're just trying to defend him. And it's like, no, no, no. If we all come forward and admit that we had this dumb bet going on, like mm-hmm. it will it will be more realistic. We have, we have a lot of testimony to give here. 
and uh, Cinder keeps telling them that you know this is a bad idea and that they're they're being dumb about it and finally they all turn on her eventually admitting one at a time that they are also virgins Cinder calls them cherubic and Sunshine punches her in the face because that was the final straw being called cherubic <laughs> and they all get up and tell the truth about Gary presumably he gets his job back yeah because he's right back on the bus line I still think that there would yeah. be an investigation well, so. <laughs> this is this is the part that I was trying to say earlier that I'm like this is the part that doesn't hold up anymore yes. because if there was an accusation uh, you, even if you then retracted it like yeah. this is this is super serious there would be police involved even if the victim then retracted their statement like they would still they, they still wouldn't have this tidy little oh no big deal resolution that it has here like, yeah. this is just so much more serious especially as widespread as they play the rumor like like literally everybody at camp knows that the coach had sex with one of the students that <laughs> that would be like and nobody would send their kids to that camp the next year because they had heard that rumor from their children. Yeah. This would bankrupt the company and that guy would be permanently fired from ever working with children. But no, he's right back on the bus and he helps the kids uh, meet up with their parents in this parking lot. Angel gets in the car with her mom and she says, how come you told me that sex was nothing? And she's like, what are you talking about? <laughs> Did something happen that I don't know about? And... Uh, and she says, you've been hanging out with slime balls or something like that. Yeah. She's just like, you have terrible taste in men. Come with me. <laughs> I think that that's kind of a weird line here because like they're, like, what you've learned in this whole situation has nothing to do with what your mom's been doing. Like, I don't really understand. Unless it's literally as simple as, you told me sex doesn't matter. You're doing it wrong. <laughs> like, <laughs> you're dating the wrong guys. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but then she drags her over to... Uh, Ferris with her dad at the car and says, this is my best friend Ferris. Mm. And her newly single dad. Yeah. Yeah, so that was, a, that was a setup, right? Is that, I'm pretty that's sure. what that was supposed to be? Yeah. yeah. Okay. That would be, in my mind, that's the only reason that they bothered to include a thing about Ferris's parents splitting up. It's so that they could, we could parent set, trap these set guys. her up with mm. the, this mom. <laughs> and then, yeah, it's a par- parent trap prequel. And Little Darlings too. Yeah. I guess, yeah, it could be a sequel... Uh, entry but it just like other than that there's no reason to because she's only sad for like a scene and a half and it has no bearing on the story besides him now being single and being able to be stepsisters with her new best friend well i think her being sad was to give us an opportunity to then be like i need to talk to you to manipulate yeah gary yeah i guess that's possible too um well she was probably also feeling a little bit more vulnerable and like willing to do something that she wasn't like this was this is like i want to feel something else right i'm gonna have sex and then i'm gonna feel totally different about everything about life right little darlings was shown in on television in a very heavily edited version which had all of the sex related scenes and dialogue removed it was 20 minutes long (laughs) (laughs) but it, it also says that scenes were added so there were scenes that they shot that were deleted scenes so they put them back in the movie, including one scene where, like, Angel rescues Ferris from drowning in the lake during a thunderstorm. No, Somebody... So she really can't swim? Yeah, that apparently. Like a... They uh, they added more songs, presumably over more montages. Um, but the director said that he had no participation in the TV version and does not approve of it. I feel like... And I love Tatum O'Neill. And I like the character of of addy loggins in paper moon is like one of my all-time favorite film characters and um i think she does a really great job and i i wouldn't say that she didn't deserve the oscar for that even though she was an eight-year-old kid and she's she's also great in bad news bears as the amanda Wurlitzer character but here i feel like she might be the worst actress of the cast And it bothers me in a couple places. I just feel like uh, everyone is acting like it's a very real situation and they're real people going through something. And everything she says is very stilted. And and she says everything in a very like consciously delivered, acty way. 
And it, it almost reads like ADR every time she starts talking. It does. It did feel like ADR a lot. I actually thought a lot of lines were ADR'd back in because they just they felt out of place and didn't feel like the same tone as the rest of the scene. Yeah, and and uh, she's really not given a lot to do, it, it, with the exception of like we said, the couple scenes where she's supposed to be sad about her parents breaking up, where she doesn't like aside from frowning and maybe talking less, she doesn't do much. Where throughout the whole movie uh christy mcnichols is constantly like tearing up over things and and seems very real and is having very genuine emotional reactions to everything going on around her i just feel like she's doing 10 times the work in this movie and and i feel like it felt lopsided to me because christy mcnichol gets so much to do and her story arc is more interesting and that at the last second they were like what if Tatum's parents are getting a divorce or something? Is that does that does that give her as much to do? Does that even it out? And it just felt like they were just trying to add stuff that didn't really need to be there. But like I said, I I love Tatum and and, and everything else I've seen her in, she's great. And I wouldn't say she's bad in this either. I would just say that she she seems to be doing a different kind of acting than everyone else is. Yeah, I I, I would say that's a fair assessment. The director Ron Maxwell. This was his first film. Lately, it seems like he mostly does Civil War films. He did Gettysburg, Gods and Generals, and Copperhead, which are all three um, about the Civil War mm-hmm. in various respects. Um, the writer and um, the person who wrote the story, Kimmy Peck, this is her only credit on IMDb. Uh, Daylene Young has a lot of TV movie credits. She also wrote the 1995 Babysitter's Club with Rachel Lee Cook, Skylar Fisk, and Larissa Olenek. The music here was from Charles Fox, who we just had do the music for uh, Last Married Couple. Ferris is Tatum O'Neill, who uh, we said she won an Oscar at eight for Addie Loggins in Paper Moon. She was Amanda Wurlitzer in Bad News Bears. She also apparently played a character, uh, Alice Forsythe, in another Bogdanovich movie called Nickelodeon. Have you ever seen that? I have not. I haven't either, but Bogdanovich directed Paper Moon. Mm. And this is her with the same director, and her dad is in it also, but I don't think playing her dad. Um, and it looks like it's also a period piece because I think the cover has like a hot air balloon or something. And well, it's yeah, called Nickelodeon. Well, and yeah, Nickelodeon like makes me think of like... Old school theater. Yeah, yeah. So um, seems like something I should check out because it sounds a lot like Paper Moon. It might have just been an attempt to recreate the, the magic of that film. In adulthood, she played Maggie Gavin in 39 episodes of Rescue Me and was apparently a realtor in This Is 40, the Judd Apatow movie. Hmm. I need to rewatch that. And like we said before, too, she was uh, she played Dakota Fanning's mother in the Runaways film, which is the right. fictional retelling of the story of the band. Um, Christy McNichol was Angel. She was Julie Sawyer in White Dog. Have you ever seen that? I have not. I haven't seen it either, but I've had it described to me several times. It's like a girl adopts a dog and then finds out that the dog is racist. And it's like a Cujo dog. Sorry, but what the, movie is this? It's called White Dog. No, and it's about a girl who gets it. a dog from a shelter and it turns out that the dog is like viciously racist. But is and it Rottweiler? I, I don't remember. Uh, she also played Mabel Stanley in the Pirate movie. Have you ever seen the Pirate movie? I have not seen the Pirate movie either. I know we I... had it at our blockbuster, yeah. but I never rented it. Um, Armand DeSante is Gary. Uh, this is not the kind of role I've ever seen from him. Yeah, this is this is really peculiar. <laughs> he's He's always like a bad guy in a Stallone movie type character. Mm. Um, He was that specifically in uh, Judge Dredd. Yeah. Rico. But he was also Gotti in the the movie about John Gotti called Gotti. Um, (laughs) Gotti, Gotti, Gotti. Not the John Travolta one. (laughs) Yeah, not the John Travolta one. Very terribly. Is is that the new record for like the worst performing box office ever? Gotti? Uh, It might be. It's pretty pretty bad. That makes sense too because I'm pretty sure it was produced by the movie pass people. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> who were just like in oh a Brewster's boy. Millions trap of if you can burn through eighteen million dollars of uh, of uh, funding in in a year, then you'll get ninety billion dollars or whatever. I don't know what the plan was, but Armand Asante was also uh, Zeko Khan in The Road to El Dorado, um, which is a good movie, uh, under celebrated I would say. He played Henri Tremont in Private Benjamin later this year. Which uh, he does a little French speaking here because he's a French teacher. Also, it seems like he speaks fluent French, so um, I wouldn't be surprised if Henri Tremont speaks a little French in uh, Private Benjamin. <laughs> um, he's also, according to his IMDb page, uh, he has 16 movies 
in various stages of production right now. What? <laughs> there was 16? like from pre-production to post, there were 16 different titles that were all like in progress. Matt Dillon was Randy. This was his second feature after Over the Edge, which I know nothing about. Most people probably know him from something about Mary. Um, he was Dallas in The Outsiders. Uh, he was nominated for Supporting Actor in Crash, but I don't think he won that Oscar. Um, and I really liked him as uh, Hank Chinaski in Factotum. Did you ever see that one? Uh, no. It's the Charles Bukowski adaptation, mm. um, but it's fun. That and uh, what's the one with um, Mickey Rourke where he's playing like a Mitch Hedberg type of Bukowski um, Barfly? I, th- I think I, Factotum I and I Barfly would be an amazing double feature. Margaret Bly was Mrs. Bright, which is uh, Angel's mom. Uh, didn't recognize a lot of credits, but I had to call out Betty Lee in Ginger Dead Man, <laughs> which is that movie where Gary Busey's ghost. Uh, Gary Busey is a criminal whose ghost is put into a gingerbread man that kills people or something like that. Which is funny because Jake Busey is a ghost in The Frighteners. <laughs> oh, that's true. And he's also a monster in Stranger Things. And uh, Alexa Kennan played Dana. Uh, she was also Jenna Homan in Pretty in Pink, but I don't remember that character. Um, and then Cynthia Nixon, obviously, as Sunshine, this was her first credit ever. She, she came back for The Manhattan Project. And then, obviously, Sex in the City is what everybody knows her from. Oh, sorry. Back to Margaret Bly. Uh, she's in Waterhole Number 3. What is that? Oh, it's a really weird Western with James Coburn and Carol O'Connor. Waterhole Number 3? Yeah. Interesting. Um, Cynthia Nixon also, like, uh, involved in politics a lot lately. She's been running against... Uh, I think she's been running for, like, governor of New York State? I don't remember. She was in one of those races recently. I think she just lost last year or, year before um uh so i want to go back to our mysterious uh kimmy peck yes <laughs> so i was just poking around here and it seems poking around on peck here and it seems as though she is both a dog rescuer and possibly a hoarder of animals oh interesting yeah she seems to have gotten herself into some trouble um uh, here, here both in the state of California and in Colorado and has been uh, arrested and charged with uh, uh, having like too many little dogs and animal cruelty and you know they found like 53 dogs with her Oof. at one point so seems well intentioned but she her she, heart's in the right place she, she might have some problems with animals yes that sounds accurate speaking of that Jess is this an up or a down for you Oh, it's definitely enough for sure, Richard. Oh yeah, yeah. This this movie was a was a again going into it not having seen it and knew nothing about it uh, was very surprised at how well it handled the subject without mm-hmm. being stupid, like <laughs> <laughs> like a lot of movies do. Yeah, I'm. It's an up for me also. Where does this go on your list, Jess? Uh, let me find my list. Actually, it might just be right at the top. Where is my list? You know what? I'm putting it at the top. All right. Wow. It's at the top of my 1980 list this year, I, which is ahead of Ninth Configuration because I would watch this movie all the time. All right. Richard? Um, this is up higher on my list, but uh, not that high. Uh, I think I'm going to – I think I'm still going to put Foxes ahead of it. Okay. Um, which puts it between Foxes and Coal Miner's Daughter. Okay. Um, for me, this is going uh, fourth place for the year. So it's right between Ninth Configuration and Mad Max for me. It's a solid film, and uh, I enjoyed it. And like you said, I would watch it again right now. If it started up on TV, I would sit down and watch the yep. whole thing again. It's great. Because all the kids, all, all this, the entire supporting cast is giving like a very genuine, honest uh, performance, and they just feel like real kids. And they're all funny in different ways, but they feel like they genuinely got along on set. And yeah. It's just, it's a sweet movie. And uh, Yeah. Well, and I feel like I, you know, like I really love Ninth Configuration. And I really love my brilliant career and, you know, these things. But like, I lean towards comedy, you know, yeah. and like this, this, this movie is fun and funny to me. And so I'm, I'm going to probably put a comedy ahead of, of a more serious film just because I'd rather watch a comedy. Sure. I think that's about it for this one. 
Uh, if you guys have any thoughts you'd like to share with us, we are Vintage Video Pod on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Letterbox. Whereas I've said before, you can find each of our full movie rankings for the year. We can also be found at vintagevideopodcast.com. Please consider rating us on iTunes to help people find the show. And if you take the time to leave us a review, we will thank you personally in an upcoming episode. If you're feeling especially generous, you can support the show through patreon.com slash vintage video podcast. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you'll join us next time when we'll be discussing Nijinsky, which is about, uh, I'm going to describe this one because I don't have the description in front of me. It's about Václav Nijinsky, a ballet performer from the 1910s and his life. We leave you now with the trailer for Nijinsky. Nijinsky. I didn't choose Vaslav for Sacre de Printemps because I sleep with him. He was possessed by a man. I don't want to be with you. I can't breathe with you. I can't think. He was loved by a woman. I know you only married me because you thought you lost him. He was acclaimed by the world. Nijinsky. I am the flesh. I am the feeling. Spirit. I am in love. I am a clown of God. I am Nijinsky. Alan Bates as Diaghilev. Please take him back. What if I don't want him back? Love isn't eternal, you know, my dear. It has its own time. Leslie Brown as Romola. I love you. I'll make it all right. I'll make everything all right. And introducing George de la Pena as Nijinsky.